All right. Well, open your Bibles, please, to um, 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Marriage, singleness, and God's will, part two. Um, Well, based on that, there should be about a hundred parts to this because it's such a vast subject, and we're not going to do that. We'll just handle it in the two weeks um, that I've allotted for it. So last week we looked at the first uh, 17 verses, and uh, this week we're going to go through the rest of the chapter. Last week we looked at for the most part, we talked about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And I know we only looked at parts of that. Uh, I want to zoom over a piece of that again, and then we'll start to look at the, the second half of uh, the chapter. Let me read through again these, uh, these first verses. Paul says this, Now concerning the things of which you wrote to me. And again, uh, Paul is writing this letter with two ideas in mind. One is he's, he's writing a disciplinary letter. He's writing about problems in the church. He's writing about divisions among them. He's, he's, he's rebuking them because they're divided when they should be united. I mean, imagine that, Christians actually being divided on something. He's, he's criticizing them because they're divided when they should be united. And then you know, later on, he's criticizing them and he's, and he's rebuking them for being united when they should be divided, when they should be dividing, because they're tolerating open, raw sin in the fellowship. And, you know, we, we, we've lost, in many ways, I think, we've lost track of just how pure God has always intended the church to be. We've tolerated so much in our day and age. We were just getting into a discussion about this uh, in the kitchen before we came out here. We, you know, when worship team, you know, we, we pray before we come out and there's usually some big discussion we get into. And uh, we were talking about the idea that when you look back at the early church fathers and you look at the things that were so important to the church in those days, things that the average Christian doesn't even think about today about really how important the Godhead is, how important the Trinity is, things like that. We either just take it for granted or we accept the fact like, well, you call yourself a Christian, but you don't believe that, okay. You call yourself a Christian, but you don't believe in the virgin birth. Look, that's okay. No, you're not a Christian. But, you know, and even there, when I said something like that, some of you bristled, like, what do you mean? How can you say that? Because I have a Bible. And I go by the Bible. And I say, I say this to say that the church, if you were to look at church history in general, it, it goes in waves like life, like business, like, you know, and, and, and there have been times where the church is really seeking to be pure before the Lord and other times where it hasn't. But I mean, if we go back and some of us have been in the Lord for 40, 50 years, and if you think back to even the 70s or the 80s and the things you learned about the Bible, the things you learned about the Lord and how important it was to walk a certain way, what it meant to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ, not just an attender, not just someone who walks in, walks out, but someone who really is a follower, a a disciple. What is a disciple? Don't think of the apostles. A disciple is, all it means is to follow, to, to learn and to follow. In reality, if you look at the church in general, and I'm just talking about America today, if you look at the church in general, and let's just talk about the Protestant church. In fact, let's talk about the conservative part of the Protestant church. We've just gone from a lot of people who call themselves Christians, narrowed it down, narrowed it down, narrowed it down, and even in that sliver of 30 million people, maybe, There's so much tolerance for all kinds of things. Tolerance for um, open lifestyles, for for inebriation, all sorts of things that even 10 years ago, and especially 25 or 30 or 40 years ago, that same part of the church would have said, yo, brother, what are you doing? Oh, sister, what are you doing with your life? And we'd have a talk. And I don't mean the pastors and the elders, but each of us. 
would have a conversation with that person because we know that that's not walking with the Lord. That's walking in compromise. And, and so, you know, I get off on this uh, little tangent right from the jump because when we, when we talk about these topics of divorce and remarriage, I'm sensitive to this as a pastor. Uh, you know, when, when, when I became a pastor 26 years ago, I, most of you know some of my, you know, uh, my testimony that Renee and I had been booted out of a church. That's a strong way of putting it, but well, we were kicked out. Um, <laughs> because of some doctrinal points that we held differently from, from the from the, the senior pastor of that church. And, and one of those was divorce and remarriage. I mean, there are many people still today in parts of the church who believe no divorce, no remarriage. And, and you can make the case, as far as I'm concerned, read through the scripture. And if you've heard me teach about it, you've heard me say that there are biblically justifiable divorces and similarly then remarriages. It's not God's desire. It's not God's design. And yet... It's there in the scripture. But there's, a, there's an important point that we must choose, which is to hold to the core, hold to the truth of the gospel, of course, but the word of God in general and the things that he teaches. And so here's Paul now speaking to the Corinthians and saying, look, you're divided. You're, you're divided over the, some of the craziest things. As some say I'm of Paul, some say I'm of Apollo, some say I'm of Peter. You know, some of you are super pious. You say, well, I'm of Christ. Well, aren't we all? Aren't we all to be that? That would be like us to say, well, I, I'm of Joe Foch. You know, um, I, I'm of Wesley. I'm of Calvin. I'm of this. You know, we, we divide over the silliest things. As important as those men may be, they're just men. And, and so Paul's saying you're, you're divided when you should be one, you should be united. And, and where there's sin in the church, you glory in this somehow. You're, you're, you have this false, um, you think you're showing grace by tolerating the sin of this man who's sleeping with his father's wife. And he's saying that's such, that's such just bold out and out blatant sin and yet you the leadership of the church you accept these things so he he criticizes them about some things and then he the second half of the uh the the letter he's answering their questions and there's a lot of them so this one has come up about marriage about divorce about singleness and what is right and what is the god's will and should we get married and what do we do in the case of persecution because they were undergoing that this is something you and i don't understand. We may think we understand it or, and, and I encourage you, if you've never um, looked at some of the, uh, some of the, some of the organizations like Voice of the Martyrs, people like this, the, the organizations who really represent our brothers and sisters around the world who are being brutally persecuted. We should, we should, we should pay attention to that. It's coming our way. There's a, there's a false sense of, um, confidence that has come over the church just in the last few weeks since Trump was elected. He's the president-elect of the United States of America. That's all he is. That's all he is. And in the midst of that complacency, we have no idea what's also coming. And so I, I say all this to say, so now Paul talks about these topics and, and he says, you asked me about some things, so let me tell, tell you about one. It's good for a man not to touch a woman. He's speaking of sexual relations. He says, nevertheless, because of sexual immorality, or, or in other words, in order to avoid adultery, pornea is the word, we get pornography from that. Let each man have his own wor- wife and let each woman have her own husband. I'm just going to read it through and then we'll We'll zero in. Let the husband render to his wife the affection due her, and likewise also the wife to her husband. The wife doesn't have authority over her own body, but the husband does. And likewise, the husband doesn't have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except with consent for a time, so that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, so that Satan does not tempt you because of your lack of self control. But I say this as a concession and not as a command. 
For I wish that all men were even as I myself. But each one has his own gift from God, one in this manner, another in that. He suggest, he's, what he's saying here is, I'm single. Now, we talked about this idea last week that it appears that he was married at one point, and whether his wife divorced him or she died, but he, he would have been married, in my opinion. I gave you some of my reasons for that. He was a rabbi, he was a Pharisee, he was a member of the Sanhedrin. All of those required that a man be married. But he became a Christian, and that was like, <laughs> that's capital event in, in the whole society at that point. And, and it could be that his wife divorced him. We don't know. There's no record. But I wish that all men were as I myself, but each one has his own gift from God. In other words, he has the gift to, to resist the sexual temptations, one in this manner, another in that. But to the unmarried and to the widows, I say, it's good for them if they remain even as I am. But if they can't exercise self-control, let them marry, for it's better to marry than to burn. The suggestion is with lust or with passion, and then to get out of control. Now to the married I command, yet not I, but the Lord, that a wife is not to depart from her husband, but even if she does, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband, and a husband is not to divorce his wife. As to the rest, I, not the Lord, I say, if any brother has a wife who does not believe and she's willing to live with him, let him not divorce her. And if a woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he's willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the husband. Otherwise your children would be unclean, but now they're holy. But if the unbeliever departs, let him go. Let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. In other words, no longer bound to that marriage is the idea. But God has called us to peace. For how do you know a wife whether you'll save your husband or how do you know a husband whether you will save your wife? All right, uh, I just read through a whole lot not to go over it again, but to give us some background as we go into this next portion. But also in order to circle back on something that I really didn't, well, I said it, I said something about it last week, but I didn't explore it deeply enough. I'll also underscore the fact that Andrew and Josh did not volunteer for this <laughs> chapter. Um, they are smart, they're very smart. Um, the reason I'm hesitating is I, I want to be careful to cover this uh, and not to go off into a whole lot of things. Here's, here's my issue. You know, when we read through the scripture, what, what are the passages? Have you ever really thought about them? What are the passages in the Bible that speak to the topic of divorce, for that matter, the, the passages that speak to marriage itself. Um, so on the topic of divorce, um, usually the one that pops up for many people if they've studied this topic, uh, Malachi, Malachi 2.16, God hates divorce, or I hate divorce, says the Lord. That's true. Um, and and I, I want to be careful not to get into a, a lot of side things on this. I know that's a surprise that I would say such a thing, but because um, we're going to finish chapter 7 tonight, I don't want to deal with some, some issues here, but um, in Malachi 2.16, and the problem is I'll drop the bomb and probably not go and diffuse it. Um, Malachi 2.16, uh, uh, I hate divorce, says the Lord, or the Lord says, I hate divorce, um, is actually not the best English translation of the Hebrew. And incidentally, of course God hates divorce. God hates drunkenness. God hates every sin you can imagine. We're the ones who tend to um, stratify sin. This sin's worse than that sin. And I understand why, and there's a place for that. But it's only the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. Is that right? Okay, so yes, God does hate divorce, but I wouldn't build my case about divorce on, on that. Um, 
where divorce really is mentioned, where we see it in a, in a very real uh, and clearly uh, explained way, if you would, is in Deuteronomy chapter 24. I'm not going back there, look at it, but for you, if you want to look at it, you should uh, take a look at those first, I guess I'd say five or six verses in Deuteronomy 24, because that's where Moses explains why, why one can give the other a writ of divorce. And it's, it's, that, it's that passage that is the basis of the ones we're most familiar with in the Gospels. In Matthew, especially Matthew 19, but in, in the three, um, you know, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, the Lord speaks about marriage and divorce and remarriage. And basically, they're called the exception verses because he's saying one who divorces his wife and marries another makes her, his new wife, uh, an adulteress. And he also makes his wife, his, his first wife, an adulteress. Except for, that's why it's called an exception verse, except for fornication except for adultery, it might, it might be translated in your Bible. So he's saying with the exception of adultery, with the exception of fornication, um, remarriage is not permitted after, after a divorce. You with me? Three people seem to be. Okay, I guess we're doing better than normal. So, all right, so just very quickly, what they're doing, the, these, the, the scribes and Pharisees are asking his opinion. Now they're trying to trap him, but they're asking his opinion about d- divorce and remarriage, but it's all based on what Moses wrote in Deuteronomy 24. When Jesus answered, they say, why then did Moses command that a man gives his wife a writ of divorce? And he said, you know, Moses didn't command, Moses permitted it. It's all based on Deuteronomy 24. So if you want to understand the topic better, you need to understand Deuteronomy 24. It's not difficult to understand, but you should read it. Um, And then when you, again, I asked, you know, what are the divorce passages? Not many. When you come to 1 Corinthians 7, now you're in another one. So I say all that to say, I explored a few different trails with you last week to give you an an understanding, hopefully an explanation of God's, uh, you know, God's view and his commands with regard to marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And what grace really is. Because there are, in our church, perhaps even in this room, people who were at one time divorced as believers, as believers, possibly divorced, under, cir- under conditions that were not permitted by the Lord. And now they're remarried. Are these people still in a state of sin? No, if you're, the blood of Christ has covered that sin. Now that's not a license to go and do what we want to, saying God will cover me. That's not it. We're to seek the Lord on these things. Okay, so we, we covered those basics last week. The problem that many of us have and uh, the problem that uh, elders and pastors will have and counselors will have in a church is dealing with the, you know, if, 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 if there's a couple file folders that we can talk about that these are um, biblically acceptable, I hate that word, but you know, biblically permissible divorces and remarriage. What about all these other situations? And if you were here last week, and you're back this week, you're either crazy or brave, okay? But um, then you you know that I didn't cover all those possible permutations. Number one, because it's not really possible to, but there are categories that come up. Um, I know I mentioned uh, physical abuse. By, by the way, I got more response from men. I said something last week. I said, one of the things, and I, I said to Scott, we need to do this. I don't know if you've done anything on this yet, but we need to move on this. We need to have a brother's ministry so that some of the brothers take a brother outside and jack him up against the wall if he's mistreating his wife. I got three or four volunteers. 
I mean, Tito texted me the next day. I'm in California, but I just listened to your teaching. I'm coming back and I want to be in that group. <laughs> um, so good. Yeah, because physical abuse, in my opinion, and this is, this is in my opinion, but you can make the case from the scripture, in my opinion, uh, you're breaking the covenant with your wife at that point. And um, th there's always room for repentance and there's always room for forgiveness. And Jesus makes the point in Matthew 19 that Moses permitted divorce for the hardness of heart. The question is, hardness of whose heart? And I think it goes both ways. The hardness of the sinner's heart as well as the hardness of the victim's heart where the, the victim is like, I, I, can't, I can't do this anymore, right? Um, we all know situations like that or perhaps you've been in those situations. The, uh, the category, if, if that's the word for it, that I didn't cover well, um, I, I mentioned what we generally refer to as um, emotional abuse. And I think I used a phrase like, that's a tough one to quantify. And I moved on from there. I didn't intend to move on and just leave anybody hanging. Um, usually what, what happens when you're in my situation is you talk so much that you wouldn't understand, but uh, you only do from that standpoint watching. Okay, We're so, much con so much talking has happened and then you see the clock and you say, oh, I have to finish this before that time. Um, and so I, I moved on from there. But the other issue is that, as I said about five minutes ago, there are these areas, right, or I call them file folders, of, of these are topics, these are, these are matters that really can destroy a marriage. And the, and the Bible speaks to them. And then there are these areas where it's hard to find chapter and verse. It doesn't mean the Bible doesn't speak of them, but you have to be careful that you're not putting together an argument from a word out of that passage and a word out of that passage to make, to make your case. Because the reality is that emotional abuse in a marriage is very real. It does happen. And, and there are those, and I know them, I know, you know, I know brothers, meaning other uh, other pastors and leaders in churches who will say it doesn't matter and it, or it doesn't exist. Uh, we can get over anything. Well, in one sense, we can theoretically get over anything, but um, it's a very difficult one. Not to say the topic's a difficult one. The topic is the topic, but each one has to be explored individually. And even in saying that, part of some of you could probably read through the lines in, in what's coming out of my mouth here. I know that the moment I start to lift the lid and say, well, under this situation, we would do this, and under this situation, we would do that, and under this situation, we'd do that, each, each case stands on its own. And we've found over the years that uh, you know, Steve and I in particular, you know, we, we work through these situations individually with the couple, with the wife, with the husband, and we help them at, at every point to restore their marriage. And when it's not restorable, we, we explore what direction we go from there. So emotional abuse is a very real thing. Uh, these claims that come are, are very real. And having said that, though, let's face it, if we're talking about your emotions or my emotions, just, just saying yours or my emotions. Subjective is the word you got to use because you can't, when I said it's tough to quantify, you can't put a yardstick on it and say, oh, ding, 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 you hit number 10. You know, it doesn't work that way. And yet, I, I kind of hate the phrase, but you know it when you see it. And um, so it's very real, uh, and yet it's, it's a subjective thing. Those who haven't seen it, and I, now I'm speaking of leaders, you know, pastors, elders, if they've never seen it before and they hear stories, it can be tempting sometimes to either say, ah, or to say, you know, red alert, red alert, and, and this is grounds for divorce. Neither extreme is the immediate 
you know, the knee jerk is not the, is not the proper response. We have to work through it with the, with the couple. And, and our role has always been to seek forgiveness, you know, repentance, forgiveness, and restoration of the marriage. And sometimes it's just not possible. Sometimes it's just not possible. So I, you know, other than that, I would, I would engage in sideline conversations, not publicly. I'm not going to get into all of that right now. But uh, okay, so having said all that and probably dug enough of a hole for myself, um, so now what does Paul have to say? Well, again, let's try to remember what's happening. Paul is writing to Corinth. Um, some of these things you've, you've heard me say, it's been said by many people. Corinth was um, a city in the first place that was raging in sin. Um, Corinth, the church, this was a, a group of believers who had the Holy Spirit in ways that, incidentally, we're not witnessing here. I'm just going to say it. We don't witness it in our congregation. So it's easy for us to be critical of Corinth and to say, oh, look at all their sin. Yeah, but look at how God was pouring out his spirit there. So he was doing that. And at the same time, they were getting drunk at the communion table. They weren't drinking thimbles of Welch's. You know, they were getting snockered. And, and, and they, were, they were gorging on the food. Um, they were, I mentioned already, chapter 5, you know, they, they were raging in adultery. They were famous for fornication. They were known that when you were called a Corinthian, it was a, it was a slanderous term in the empire to call someone a Corinthian because Corinth, the city, was known for all of this. And the church... You know, think about it. I mean, we all, we all have our own backgrounds, what we came from. And some of us, you know, I, I think I've worked out or the Holy Spirit has worked out much of my past from me. You know, the problem is I, I, I don't remember the things I should remember and the things I wish I couldn't remember anymore. I do. Um, but yeah. Uh, but you know, you know what it's like when you see a brand new believer and uh, they're still using the same language they've been using forever and doing this and doing that. And, and it's like, I'm not saying I love seeing that, but I love seeing it in the sense that I know that they love the Lord and, and they just want to grow in him because they know what they were saved from. So many of us, and maybe this shoe doesn't fit you, but I know it fits a lot of people who aren't sitting in these seats. And that is that it's easy to have forgotten who we used to be. And what we've done is to exchange an appropriateness for life in Christ. Having, in a sense, just dropped off the true life in Christ and have exchanged an, what I call an appropriateness, something that's socially acceptable among the other believers that I see on every Sunday or Wednesday or whenever I'm around them and I know how to say praise the Lord and hallelujah and, and all those things. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just saying if we're not careful, this is a danger for each one of us. So now he says, but as God has distributed, verse seven, 17, as God has distributed to each person, as the Lord has called each one, so let him walk. And so I ordain in all the churches. What's he saying? We, you know, the way of summing this up, you could say a lot of people like to call this bloom where you're planted. Was anyone called, in other words, called to Christ? Now some of this you, you, you read and you say, what? What are you talking about, man? Was anyone called while circumcised? Well, he's talking to men. Was, was anyone called while circumcised? A Jew. Let him not become uncircumcised. Huh? Well, believe it or not, they're, they're, uh, this is what, around 65-ish, 60-ish, 62-ish AD. You go back 
200 years from here, back uh, during, you know, we're, we're coming upon Hanukkah soon, right? Well, remember Hanukkah? Remember what Hanukkah is all about? It's not just the Jewish kids get eight gifts. It, it, remember, it's all about uh, Antiochus Epiphanes, the Greek ruler, had control over Jerusalem. He slaughtered a sow on the altar, and Judas the Maccabee and his sons, they led a rebellion finally against Antiochus Epiphanes, and they threw him off, and um, and they reestablished God's rule over, over the kingdom of, of Judah. Yeah, well, in the process of doing that, um, or prior to doing that, they had, not the Maccabees, but, but during that time, they had developed, <laughs> this is weird to talk about it at a Bible study, but they had developed, I'll just go quick, they had developed a procedure, <laughs> they had developed a procedure um, to, in effect, reverse, not a real reversal, but to, and, and to, to appear to have reversed a circumcision. You can, you can take your video mind and go from there, okay? But it's true. Josephus writes about it in his Antiquities of the Jews, and, uh, and it's actually written in 1 Maccabees. They, they, he's written about it. So Paul's saying, and, and this was a big deal. I mean, you know, and men did business together back in those days. We don't do this thing, but you know, they would, you know, it wasn't just working out in a, in a sports club, but they would, you know, they would, they would sit in the bathhouses and it was pretty easy to tell who was and who wasn't circumcised. And so um, he says, was anyone called while circumcised? You were a Jew and you got saved. Don't make yourself uncircumcised. All right. Was anyone called while uncircumcised? Let him not become circumcised. Circumcision is nothing. Uncircumcision is nothing. But keeping the commandments of God, that's what matters. By the way, did you hear, did you read what he said? That's for each one of us. You may not be bothered about the circumcision, uncircumcision thing, but what matters is we're called to obey the Lord. We're called to follow the Lord. Keeping his commands is what matters. It's not about being under the law. It's about obeying our God. Let each one abide or let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. In other words, where, wherever you were in life at the time, don't say, now that I'm a Christian, I have to do this. Yeah, I, I, I find this often enough and I remember what it was like early on when I, when I got saved, I remember there was like this sense about me that I was really called, I really had a sense in my being that there were certain areas that I was called to. And even though I was in business at the time, this goes back into the late 70s, early 80s, I was going to do this and do that with my life for the Lord. Well, they ended up happening not the way I would have thought back in 1980, 81, 82. But I'm doing it now. But God had a plan. Very often God, God plants those little seeds in our hearts about what he wants to do with our lives. But the fulfillment of those things doesn't come right away. And it's dangerous for us if we're not careful to strive to accomplish or achieve those things. I know of people who they want to get in ministry as a profession. We're not professionals. That's pretty obvious. Just listen to me. <laughs> you know? Um, no, we're not, it's a calling. It's not a profession. You know, I'm not saying it's not, anyhow. But I'm not saying it's not important, right? He's saying, don't, don't feel like you have to do these things. Just, again, bloom where you're planted. Grow in the Lord from, from that point forward. Let each one abide or remain in the same calling in which he was called. Were you called while you were a slave? That was a big deal in the empire. You were a slave. Don't be concerned about it. But if you can be made free... Do it. Use it. For he who is called in the Lord while a slave is the Lord's freedman. Likewise, he who is called while free is Christ's slave. Do you know that you are? I think we skip over those verses sometimes. But we're called to be slaves to righteousness. We're called to follow him. I, you know, it, it always, I don't like to use the word haunt, but it bugs me in a good way. When I I hear Jesus saying in Luke, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but you don't do the things I say? Ouch. That pinches. And if it doesn't, there are bigger issues. Right? And so, he says, you were bought at a price, which we should remember. Do not become slaves of men. And boy, we can do that. We can even become slaves of men 
by being divided over things we should be united on. By saying, I'm a Calvinist. Or I'm a, I'm a Wesleyan. Or, or I'm a, a, a Darbyist. Or I'm, some of you are like, who, who's these people? But I find it so frequently in the church, people are going to put down their pillars and plant themselves on certain theologians. It's not worth it. Let's, if we're anything, let's be biblicists. Let's get to know the word of God. And those people, Theologians will inform us or not as we, as we move on. Now concerning virgins, and as he says this, our, tempta- our temptation is to think women. Now a virgin, as he uses the word here, is anyone, male or female, who is unmarried. Okay? Never been married is the idea. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment from the Lord. He's saying, this is my opinion. It's, a, it, it's my opinion as the Apostle Paul. I'm a rabbi, a Pharisee. I've done all these things. This, I know the word of God. It's not like I have a revelation from God that says this is what you're to do. Jesus, you look through the Gospels yourself. Jesus didn't speak about this. So he's saying, I have no direct commandment from the Lord, uh, but I, I give judgment as one whom the Lord in his mercy has made trustworthy. In other words, the Lord has entrusted me with his spirit and his word. And so what I'm about to say to you, I have confidence before the Lord that this is, that this is right. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress or the present condition, your Bible may say, that it's good for a man to remain as he is. What's he talking about? What's he talking about? He's, he's in, in, in light of the present situation or in, in light of the present distress, it's good for a man to remain as he is. Um, actually, he goes on and he says, are you bound to a wife? It just means married. Sometimes, you know, these old ways of saying things can get us in trouble. Um, are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be loosed. Are you loosed from a wife? Don't seek a wife. But even if you do marry, you haven't sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. Uh, Let's stop there. So let's go back. I suppose, therefore, that this is good because of the present distress. What's the present distress? Well, there was persecution, first of all, in Corinth, but also in the empire as a whole. In the empire as a whole, there was persecution that was rising up against Jews and against um, Christians. And I know we have, I know I say this a lot, we have a tendency to overlook this in our day, but it's it's rising up even in our day. Now, for us right now, when we think of persecution against Jews and Christians, we think it's the Muslims who are doing that in in our world today. It's true, because they make it very clear. And it doesn't matter if they're Shia Muslims or Sunni Muslims. They're coming for the Saturday people first and the Sunday people next. We're the Sunday people, in case you didn't do the math. So um, I'll leave that, because that's a long tunnel to go down. But um, so, so there's a persecution that we see in our society, and it's beginning to grow. But it hasn't touched you and me yet. But it's happening to our brothers and sisters really all around the world. In fact, even what has just happened in Syria, uh, at, at first it seemed like, well, there's a breath of fresh air. You know, they, they threw off Assad and he's now up in, you know, Russia and doing whatever he's doing. Uh, well, the, well, see, here comes the new boss, same as the old boss. Um, you know, it, they, they hate Christians, they hate Jews, and the persecution is already raging. A 10% of the population in Syria are Christians and they're coming for them. Um, yeah, Assad regime after 50 years has been thrown off, but they're still coming after the Jews. They're still coming after the Christians. And uh, so he says, in light of the present distress, what was happening in Corinth and what was happening in the empire? Well, what are you saying, Paul? Are you saying that if I'm single, I shouldn't get married because of the persecution? Well, he kind of is. Now, I don't know what you do with that. And I don't know how you feel about it. But it's interesting to follow through what he's saying. Now, he's not saying it's wrong to marry. 
He's going to explain that here. It's good for a man uh, to remain as he is, meaning single. Are you bound to a wife? Don't seek to be loosed. You know, don't, don't, don't say, okay, I need to get out of this marriage in order to face the persecution that's coming. Uh, or, you know, the, the reverse of that. And let's just stand back for a minute. I don't know how you feel about this. A lot of us don't think, don't want to think. It's, a, it's an ugly topic. We don't want to think about physical persecution. If you've done any reading at all, and if you haven't, you really should. Voice of the Martyrs is happy to send you a glossy, full-color magazine once every two months, I think it is now. And, uh, or you could just go online and read the stories about our brothers and sisters and what they're up against. The things that are happening in India and Afghanistan and Pakistan, and I mean, I can go on and on. They're all over the world. When you read about these things, now I don't know how you feel personally, but I can tell you, my, my sense has been for years that I will face what I got to face when the persecution comes. Excuse me. It's easy, so to speak. It's easy to be glib and to say, well, you know, if we get arrested for uh, preaching the gospel, we'll start a prison ministry. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's, it, you usually get a laugh out of it too when you say that. And there's an element of truth in it. And then if I get arrested, and then, and then you get arrested, and you get arrested, and you get arrested, we'll have a fellowship in prison, and it's not going to be a prison like that. Um, but it doesn't mean God's not going to be at work in that prison, but it's going to be a hard time. But I would rather face those persecutions, the physical persecution, alone. I suspect... I would speak for every man in this room to say I'd much rather face physical persecution alone than to have to watch Renee be harmed in front of my eyes or my children, my grandchildren. I mean, you know, my, my kids are grown up, but I see these grandkids now. I can't imagine what that would be like. And yet brothers and sisters are going through it every single day, but we live in Disney World. So these things don't affect us. But Paul's saying, in light of the present distress, in other words, what was beginning to happen there in the empire, it's better to be unmarried. He's not saying, you know, marriage is a bad thing. Of all people, Paul would, would support it completely. What's his point? Well, look what he says. He says, um, but even if you do marry, verse 28, you haven't sinned. And if a virgin marries, she hasn't sinned. Nevertheless, she, such will have trouble in the flesh, but I would spare you. Again, what's he talking about? Trouble in the flesh. Well, he's going to explain you have obligations, right? Um, I, I say this, brothers, the time is short. Man, that's a, that'll preach. I can't do it today. The time is short. The time, it's the same word that he uses in um, uh, Romans 13. It's the same word he uses in 1 Thessalonians 5 of the times and the seasons of the, of the chronos and the kairos. The chronos is the clock, chronological. You know, the kairos is the season. The time is short. We're counting down is the idea. He understood. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? He understood the time was short. He believed... And some people, some people actually say, well, Paul was a false prophet for saying this. No, he wasn't. He was a believer who believed the same thing that you and I should be believing, that in light of the things that we see and in light of what the Word of God says, the snatching away of the church is imminent. The Lord is ready to come for His bride at any moment. He really is. And most of us in this room say we believe it, but including me, I don't walk like I do. Because I'm still, and you also, we're caught up in the affairs of this world. And he's saying here that the time is short. Things are wrapping up. So that from now on, now on, even those who have wives should be as though they had none. Uh, guys, I don't know who I'm talking to when I say this, but uh, watch out where you go with that. That's not, he's not saying what you might think he's saying. He's not saying run out on your wife. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, you know, I'm bailing. He's not saying that. He's saying it's time to give our priority to the Lord. His point, 
I'll just give it to you in advance. What he's saying here in these, in these coming verses is if you're single, no matter what you think of singleness, and that's a topic we'll hit, but no matter what you think of singleness, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have one primary relationship, that's it. And that's to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, do His will, and especially in light of the present situation, in light of the fact that time is short, serve Him with all your heart and with your body and with all your mind. Give Him everything. However, if you're married, and whether we're talking about a woman or whether we're talking about a man, but speaking as a man, as, as a man, I love the Lord. I love the Lord, but I love Renee. And I have an obligation to her. So I, I have to give my life to her as well as to the Lord. Whereas if you're single, you're giving your life to the Lord and him only. See, that's, that's what Paul's developing here. And so he says, so I, I, I say this, brothers, the, the time is short. So the, from now on, even those who have wives should, should be as though they had none. Those who weep as though they didn't weep. Those who rejoice as though they didn't rejoice. Those who buy as though they didn't possess. And those who use this world uh, as not misusing it for the form of this world is passing away. But I want you to be without care. He's not saying be, be, be stupid. That's not what he's saying. He's saying, I want you to live fully committed to the Lord without the cares. It's, it's the same, it's the same word, right? When Jesus gives the parable of the, the sower and the four soils, right? The sower is the sower, he's the, right? He's the Lord. The seed that is sown is the word of God. But the four soils are four different people. And as he sows the seed, some falls on the path and the birds of the air come and snatch it away. Some falls on rocky soil and it begins to, to germinate, but then it, it can't handle it, puts down no root. And so you know, when the sun comes up and he speaks of it in terms of persecution, that it, it dies off. Other fall into um, thorny soil. It's full of weeds. And though it begins to take root and come up, the cares of this world and the deceit of, of, of riches choke out the word. The cares of this world that he speaks of there are the same cares you and I have, and they're not bad. If I'm driving home tonight and I get a flat tire, I care about fixing it. So do you. If, if I get home and I find out that Renee's been, you know, wrestling with, with the dishwasher that's, you know, on the fritz, we care about the water on the floor. We care about those things. These are legitimate cares. They're not evil. It's not sin, right? But the cares of the world will choke out the word. And, and so here he's saying, I want you to be without care. He's not saying I want you to be careless. He's saying I want you to be without cares for the, uh, I want you to be without care. He who is unmarried cares for the things of the Lord because he follows the Lord. He obeys the Lord um, and, and he cares how he can please the Lord. But he who is married cares about the things of the world, how he may please his wife. When he says the things of this world, it's not a bad thing. He cares about those things. You gotta, he has to, that man and any, anyone in here, we have a responsibility to our wives, to our children, to our families, right? So it's not a bad thing. He's just saying, let's understand the reality of life. So that when he's speaking now, as he goes into it and speaks about never married singles and once married singles, that's what there are in any society. You got two types of singles, those who've never been married and they're eligible. And those who've been married, but are now divorced or they're widowed, right? They're single nonetheless. And the question is, well, then what should they do with their lives? Because he'll give advice to, to Timothy later on that you know, the, the, the widows under the age of 60, think about what's, how old 60 would have been in that society. That's older, you know, you would think, than in our own society today. And he said, urge them to get remarried. You know, and if, you, if they don't, they're going to start to burn in lust. You go, oh, wow, okay. But 
So uh, he says, he who's married cares about the things of this world, how he may please his wife, his family, etc. There's a difference between a wife and a virgin, in case you didn't know this. The unmarried woman cares about the things of the Lord so that she may be holy both in body and in spirit. But she who is married cares about the things of the world, how she may please her husband. He's saying the same thing, just the other side of the coin. And I say this for your own profit, not that I may put a leash on you, I'm not trying to control you, but for what is proper that you may serve the Lord without distraction. You say, that's really the issue. I want you to be able to serve the Lord without distraction. We have some strange ideas about singleness. And I, I don't know in this room, I mean, I have some ideas, but um, it, it's a small group in here tonight. So, uh, and most of us are married, but some are single. And I've had a chance over the years, you know, not just 70 years, but especially as a pastor, to not just get to know single people, but to, to understand some of the challenges that single people face that most of us married people never think about. And by no means am I going to hit them all tonight. There's a tendency... Um, for single people even to wonder what value they bring, especially to the church body. Because most of us in here, as I've already said, are married. So we tend not, you know what a blind spot is, right? You're driving in your car, what's the blind spot? What is it? Does anybody know what a blind spot is? Do you? How do you define it? You can't see it. That's how you define a blind spot. It's not just how far do I have to crane my neck. The nature of a blind spot is that you're blind to it. You can't see it. We are blind to things. Forget driving now. We're blind in those areas where think we're strong usually are the areas we're weakest. And in those places where we think we've got life under control, we tend to be blind. We only see things like in my case, I see, I see life through the eyes of a married man. And most of us in here who are married, that's how we see life. And we don't tend to think about how a single person feels. I mean, I remember being single, but I've spent a much greater portion of my life married than I was single. I mean, I, <laughs> I still don't believe that. I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. I remember... Um, I got married in 1980. I was 26 years old, which at the time was actually old. You know, nowadays people seem to wait longer generally, but, uh, but back then, not so. And uh, I remember um, my mom saying, and I checked it out with my sister later on, did they really believe that? Yeah, they did. Um, what gave them the idea? But my mom said, we're so glad that you married, that you met Renee. She's such a wonderful girl. You know, your dad and I talked a couple of times and we wondered like, you know, you wondered what? <laughs> well, you know, we just want, what did you wonder? What, what are you saying? We were hoping you'd get married. Like, are you trying to say, well, no, no, no. My sister, I asked her later on, did they think I was, Yeah. Wait, did I act like it? No, they just wondered if there was... Uh, anyhow, I say that to say we have a lot of presuppositions about, especially as Christians, especially as Christians, we have presuppositions about singleness because we know the Bible. And what do we know about the Bible? If we've read anything, we've read the first couple chapters of Genesis and we know that that's where marriage is given. And God said, it's good. And we've heard people like me preach about it. And to say marriage is God's fundamental social unit. It's from marriage that comes family and then other marriages, et cetera, et cetera. All true. And so then we form our presuppositions even further. And, and these assumptions and presuppositions tend to run deep in us. We begin with the assumption that Jesus has a specific purpose for each person. Does he? 
not a trick question. Does he have a specific purpose for your life? I won't ask the next question, which is, do you know it? But, because you ought to. But, uh, but, but it's true. He does. All right, well then, if that's true, we assume that all normal people get married and have children, right? All normal people get married and have children. So if that's true, then someone who's not married is what? That's not normal. Now look, that's actually factually accurate because the norm in society is to be married. It's not a right or wrong judgment, it's just the norm. It's just the, it's this, the, uh, the how charged we make that word, normal or abnormal, right? But that is how a married Christian people look at the topic of marriage and singleness. We don't realize that it's a blind spot for us. We don't think of ourselves as like judging a single person, an adult, you know, single adult. But if seen through the eyes or heard through the ears of that single person, we would think that. The single person would think that. Like, okay, so you think I'm abnormal. In fact, the average single, I don't want to call anybody out here, but the average single person who walks into this room, into church on a Sunday morning, the person who's never been married and now they're 30 years old, or they're 40 years old, or they're 50 years old, they walk into church, what do you think they feel? They feel like the whole church is married. The whole church is married. And if the whole church is married, there's no place for me. Now, you and I know that's not true. But that's how a person feels. Some of you are thinking, you're not teaching this passage right now. You're talking about, well, yes and no. I'm talking about singleness, and I'm talking about the importance of it. And look, over the years, we've done what I think was a, a pretty decent job of trying to deal with singleness in the church. And, you know, we started young adults years ago. We didn't want it to be a, um, we didn't want to call it the singles ministry because singles ministries are usually meat markets, right? They're, right? They are. So we didn't want to call it that. And we've tried to make it a, a ministry where it's young adults, single and married. Yeah, for the most part, they're single, but still to have married young people in there because that's good. It's to, to develop a bond between the married part of the church and the single part of the church. Um, so anyhow, uh, there's a lot of these assumptions and, you know, I'm not going to go through them all. But uh, as we do, uh, well, I do know this. I know that many, most, most married Christians don't realize that we actually do often treat single people as if there's something wrong with them. We don't think about it. It's a blind spot. But we do. And whether it's, you know, we become the Yenta or, you know, we're trying to do a matchmaking thing, whatever the case may be, but there's a lot of ways in which we treat um, single people in ways we don't, we don't realize, we're, we're, but we're singling them out. And many single people, as a result, have a tendency to think, I don't want to necessarily call it a scarlet letter, but they can feel like there's something about me that's different in the eyes of these people. And I, I, I just say it to us that we need to be careful about it. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't know what it was like for you, but I, I know enough adult singles, you know, who have gone through it with their parents uh, you know, and mom and dad, or sometimes friends, other family members will say, you know, what is it? Uh, you, you just have such high standards. No one's good enough for you. You think people say that? Of course they say it. How do you think that feels to a person? You've got such high standards. Well, and of course, if that person desires to be married, right? Well, then that, that, that begins, that, that can begin the process of saying, well, I should challenge those presuppositions. Maybe I need to 
change. I don't want to lower my standards. I need to change my standards. I know enough single Christians, and usually it's a woman who, just in my experience, uh, who finds a good-looking guy makes a lot of money. Is he a believer? Well, he's Catholic. Is he a believer? Well, he's just, he's a great guy. Is he a believer? Well, he's come to church with me. Yes, but he is, is he born again? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, it, if anybody, his dog is like almost a Christian. It's like this golden retriever. It's so nice, you know. But you know what the scripture says. You ever heard that, that story? That, um, Spurgeon had a, a situation. I mean, we're back in the 1850s here or 60s. And um, Spurgeon, who was this beast of a man. And um, there was a young woman in the church who had just loved the Lord for all these years that he'd known her. And um, he... Uh, she kept talking about this guy that she was falling in love with and she wanted him married and gone through the whole question, you know, is he a believer, blah, 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 back and forth. You know, he's such a nice guy. Um, and so finally he, he put her up on a, on a chair. He stood her on a chair. I mean, Spurgeon, I think, weighed about 260 pounds. And uh, he said, pick me up. I mean, it's like someone Bridget's size, you know, pick me up. And she said, I can't. Well, just try. And she, she couldn't even get her arms that big, you know? And, <laughs> and he said, that's right. And he picked her up and he put her, took her off the chair and he put her on the floor. He said, you'll never bring him up to the, your relationship with the Lord, but he will bring you down to here. And that's exactly what happens, isn't it? And so, but, but it happens because people settle. And it's easy to settle. And often the fallacy is thinking that, you know, people are going to fill the void in our lives. People never fill the void. Only Jesus Christ fills the void, right? But we, but even having said that, we all know, you know, if you're in love with someone, if you're married, you're in love with that person, you know, there's a a spot in your life. There's a, call it the void, call it the spot, call it the hole. I don't know what you want to call it. That person fits there, right? But when we try to fit that person into a spot that only was designed for Jesus Christ, you can never go right. You can only go wrong from there. Yeah, there's a lot of things I could say on the topic, but there are assumptions that we have, you know, their assumption, and we use them as married people. Look, if you accept your singleness, you know, God's put you in the situation. If you accept the situation he's put you in, he's going to bring you a spouse. What does that mean? I've, I've heard people say this before. If you accept your singleness, you know, and just it, meaning that, that what it means is you accept the lot in life that God has established for you. Well, then, from there, God's going to, I guess the, the word would be a reward you, you know, with, with a spouse. Well, how many of us have actually accepted where we are in life? If that was the case, none of us would be married. It's just, it's, it's, it's fallacial uh, logic, but we often use it or we, you know, um, we counsel people with it. Uh, if God wants you to stay single, he will remove your desire to be married. I don't know that I've seen that. Oh, well, I, I can't say it 100%, but I know people who, you know, are very content with their singleness, but there's a place in them where they say, well, if God brought that person into my life, I would like that, but I'm content with where the Lord has me now. So it's the logic that we use, and we're not necessarily, you know, I think... We're not called to, to give this counsel to people. Yeah, I got lots of things written down, but I don't want to trouble you with them. Um, look, I would suggest, and I say this to each of us, those who are single, and especially if you're struggling with it, but especially for those of us who are married Christians, we need to get, get challenged by God's word about singleness. Because as, again, as 
easy as it is or seems to glibly say, and, and it feels right to say it, I'm not saying it's a wrong thing all the time to see it this way, that God has established marriage for a reason. Of course he established it. How else would you populate the world? And, and all the other things we know, marriage is a picture of a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can go on and on through these things. But think of your Bible for a minute. How old was Moses when he died? Does anybody remember? 120. The first third of his life, he was single for 40 years. He was a single man. You know, of course, Ruth, Boaz, we see them as married, but they were single for quite the while. You know, Ruth, of course, her husband died, um, but then she's single. Boaz, um, single, God uses them in that relationship to accomplish many things for Israel. Um, Esther, boy, Esther was single, and I'll bet there were a lot of times that uh, I have to believe that her plans for her life did not include being part of a harem. You know, like a lot of people like to think that she was part of a, a beauty contest. You can put that one out of your mind. Uh, she was sexually abused. She was trafficked. She was part of a harem. So we should see that clearly. Um, and yet God used that single woman in mighty ways. Um, Elijah, Elisha, what do you know about their wives? You know, you start to go down the list. Of Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, all single men, as far as we know. God used them mightily for his work. I mean, you can go on. There's more people. How about Mary Magdalene? Lazarus. Um, you know, you can go through these people. Pardon me? Mary and Martha. Well, yeah, Mary and Martha. So... There are so many people that God has used mightily. In fact, if, if you were to take a list, I'm not saying singleness is better than married. That's not what I'm saying in this. But you put two lists side by side, single people who God has used in the Bible, married people whom he's used. Okay, you're going to have more married people, but look at how he used these single people. I'm just saying let's challenge our blind spots about this. Now the topic of Paul's letter here in chapter 7 is to say, don't rush into marriage in light of the present distress. Don't rush into it because there's work to be done for the Lord. And if you're married, don't rush to get out of it by any means. But, you know, you have responsibilities there. You can figure that out for yourself as you read the chapter. But this understanding of what God does with every life given to him, that's the key. What God will do with every life, with any life given to him. The Apostle John, what do we know about his wife and his children? I don't know. To my knowledge, he was never married. God uses single people in a big way. So we have single people around us. And many desire to be married. Great, let's pray with them and, and help them in that way. We don't have to be the matchmaker but we can be friends to them and give them good guidance. But let's be careful about our own blind spots here to recognize that there's something powerful that God wants to do with that man or that woman's life. And it's not determined by their marital situation. It's determined by their choice to give themselves fully to the power of the Holy Spirit just as he desires to do with your life and with mine.